what I'll share with you today is I'm going to be sort of the balance on the leading edge of technology. Is that okay? So just for any of you in the room who might be technology challenged or might be, you know, sort of the lagging edge of technology, that's me. And so, well, you're on Twitter? Uh, well, Sean asked me the same question on Sunday night, and I said, well, I'm kind of on again, off again. I have a Twitter account, but I don't really twit. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? Two things. Here's what it got down to for me. If I couldn't be more than a speaker, I was going to be out of business very quickly. So very quickly, I had to establish a better value proposition than I'm a speaker. Just like many of you have had to do the same thing. And now that you have an unfair advantage, I'm guessing those value propositions will change even again. But two things for me. Number one, I improve the condition of the client. Period. My clients are not automotive related in most cases. I mean, I've been in many rooms where I hear people talk about, and Sean uh, said this yesterday, and you have to pay attention to somebody I heard uh, Jim talking about earlier, somebody who's been in the business basically their entire career, you know, and it's like, wow, man, what a wealth of knowledge, what a treasure chest packed with all the things that have happened inside our industry. But I've been around this industry for a long time, and I've driven cars since I was a kid. <laughs> Yeah, that usually goes right past me. <laughs> I was looking for something really deep. But uh, I'm going to share with you guys, I've been fortunate in that my corporate background was in the advertising business, so I worked with a lot of different companies in a lot of different industries. One of those was the automotive industry. But since then, I've worked with insurance agencies to janitorial uh, organizations, but primarily with selling organizations. And what I do, the second thing I do, improve the condition of the client. Number two, I deliver critical messages. So my clients tell me what to speak about. And then I craft a message around that. And that's really what I've attempted to do for you guys today. So I'm a student and a contrarian, in case you're wondering. I learned a long time ago you should look up words in the dictionary, even if you know or think you know what they mean. A student, we all got that. Contrarian, what does that mean? Let me give you the quick version. If 96% of the people think this, you'll find me in the other line. Okay? I'm in that small percentile because once upon a time I decided, based on the evidence I had captured as a good student, that I should be in the smaller percentile <laughs> whenever possible. And I'm going to make my case for that as we go along today. I'm actually here, guys, not to get a standing ovation, although that was nice. Thank you very much. You know, the the raucous welcome this morning, that's awesome. But I'm here to provoke you. And actually, if you looked that word up in the dictionary, you'd see that's actually a good thing. Provoke means to prompt or challenge toward action. To uh, cause deep feelings, to stir things up, to arouse or incite or kindle or galvanize. And that's what I see coming out of this group. A lot of different uh, individuals, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different timelines I'm going to talk about today, but all coming together to galvanize, and what comes out of a mastermind group like this really can't even be predicted at this point. So I'm excited to be with you guys. My background in the automotive business, just to give you a couple of quick touches there, for about 10 years, we delivered continuing education on video. And there are some individuals in this room who are our customers and, and obviously appreciate that. But we said when continuing education made its way to North Carolina, it became mandatory, you know, that dealers would actually be treated like other professionals, like real estate professionals and insurance professionals. And, and dealers didn't exactly go along with that in the beginning, right? And what I was asked to be was a trainer of continuing education. I just didn't want to go out at that point uh, and, and handle groups that really resembled torches and pitchforks who did not want to be there. Because very few dealers in the beginning wanted continuing education, yes or no? Yeah, yeah I, I'll answer that. No, they did not want it, right? Because they, I've been in the business for blank. 15 years, 25 years, 30 years. Why do I need six hours of continuing education? But once we delivered that, we brought value to a place where they said, man, I got something from that. And that's the challenge, to get something of value from whatever we deliver. 
Now, the other photo that you see there is me after about 10 years of being uh, the master of ceremonies for the National Independent Automobile Dealers Association National Quality Dealer of the Year Award. Here's what that means. You heard a little bit in the uh, opening introduction. It means I've had the opportunity to sit with over 250 of the top dealers nationally and interview them and talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. Wow, that's a pretty cool chair to be sitting in. So that's all I'm going to say really about my background in the automotive business because what I'm going to do, guys, is just share with you a timeline for me of some of my greatest lessons. And what I found is while most people think, again, here we go, we'll say 96% of the people think they want all the answers, what I found is we need to focus on asking better questions because that's where the treasure's buried. That's where all the answers lie in asking better questions. And you guys have all been asked a question where you just kind of wanted to go, right? Got to answer that one again. So what I found is in a group like this, the bar gets raised quickly. Across the, the board, the questions are better. That means the answers are bigger and the treasure becomes more profitable. So my question is, what would you change about your life or your work if you could? And what I'm going to be talking about just over the next few minutes is as much or more about your life as about your work. Because that's what I discovered once upon a time when I was having goals set for me and they were all about work. In fact, the first experience that I had in setting goals, it was just a number that someone handed to me. Can anybody relate to that? Yeah, I was in sales. It's sort of like being in traction, you know, for people who don't understand that. It sounds like someplace you can't get out of. What do you do while I'm in sales? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually a good thing. So what would you change about your life or your work if you could? And here's the good news, you can. So I want to take you back on my timeline here to 1994. When a movie came out, it was a kid's movie. Lion King, you guys all remember, right? How many of you guys have kids? Grandkids, okay, we'll talk a little bit about that today. But Lion King comes out in 1994, almost immediately, this power group gets together and they start throwing around ideas, kind of a mastermind at Disney, and one person stands up and says, I think what we need to do is, we need to create this uh, you know, Broadway play based on a kid's movie. Let's spend millions of dollars and, and do something that's never been done before. Now, how do you suppose an idea like that was met in that little mastermind group? <laughs> and I understand in the unfair advantage mastermind, there's no negative, negativity allowed, but at Disney, apparently there was. Because some guy stood up and said, that is, quote, the worst idea in the world. The best show I ever saw. <laughs> Unsolicited testimonial. Could we get a camera rolling here a little bit? So yeah, absolutely, I agree. One of the, one of the great all-time shows on Broadway. But guys, here's the thing. Let's go back to the beginning. Back to the beginning. When that was first uh, presented as an idea, that's the worst idea in the world. Three years later, not only does Lion King become a Broadway play that many of us would agree is one of the best we've ever seen, it wins six of the 11 Tony Awards it's nominated for. And just over one year ago, it eclipsed Phantom of the Opera, even though Phantom had a 10-year head start. It is now the number one all-time grossing play in, say it with me, history. Wow, wow is right. Not too bad for the worst idea <laughs> in the world. So, here is wisdom. In the beginning of new information and new ideas, Capture now, decide later. Because when does everybody want to decide whether something is a good idea or not? How about now? Yeah, now is too soon. So here's my challenge to you guys in this room, and I know you've already been doing it. I see pencils everywhere, pads of paper, bound books, just like Mr. Rohn said we should. Capturing all this information. Capture now. We have plenty of time to decide whether or not something is a good idea. So I want to give you a sort of timeline chronology of the seven breakthrough lessons that changed everything for me. Now, I don't know what it will do for you. I'm just offering it again as evidence of what I've captured along the way as a student, hearing ideas, some of which I didn't get right away. 
But later on, just holding on to that idea, just having it somewhere that I can refer back to it, it had a, a big part, played a big role in changing everything for me. And here's the thing, a lot of these lessons, guys, you won't get it today. And that's okay. And you don't need to get all seven. Okay? So, I mean, that would just be awesome. I'd just be amazing if you got all seven. Right? So I'm just looking for one. You say, man, that's the one for me. That's the reason I was here. So here's the breakthrough lessons. And let me just share this with you. That probably doesn't happen in a week or a month or a year. It's probably an epiphany. It's a revelation. It's a breakthrough. It's the light coming on for you when everybody else goes, what's the big deal? Broadway play. Kids movie. I don't get it. So here we go. Welcome to second grade. That's me. Second grade. <laughs> a different value proposition later on. Right? <laughs> but in second grade, I got the who's and the ahs. Older women really liked me. So in second grade, in second grade, my second grade teacher was Miss Eulabelle Appleton. Small town, Tennessee. Miss Eulabelle loved me. And I loved Miss Eulabelle. I was hall monitor. <laughs> that's right, so I'm watching you guys on the bathroom break, you better be, you know, that's right, sit up straight, right? I'll never forget coming home at the end of that school year, handing my report card to my mom, and she said, son, congratulations, you've been promoted. I said, mom, what does that mean? She said, that means you'll be going to third grade next year. Big problem. I didn't want to go. I had second grade all figured out. I was somebody in second grade. Right? Only later did I learn that you got to move on. you got to move up. you got to get on down the hall because you don't know what's being prepared, what's waiting for you, how it can change everything for you. What I learned is you can't stay in second grade. Now, lots of people will try. They will tell you about their 20 years experience in second grade. <laughs> but here's what I found. You can't stay in second grade. It's why they make those desks so small. <laughs> you got to get on up, get on down the hall and see what's waiting for you. And guys, I did that. 1975, I graduated from high school. And within about 45 days, I was in the United States Air Force. Right off the farm, my first plane ride was to Lackland Air Force Base. Now that's me, and uh, people say, what position did you play? Well, that's it right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somebody got to do it, right? I'm a role player, so that's me, helmet off. You can do it. Let's go, right? Uh, and that's not too far from the truth. But then uh, there's me, man, in the United States Air Force out there, uh, you know, signing up to take care of my country. How many of you guys know I was a little over my head? In that role, right? Yeah, I was a little underwater in the deep end of the pool, but here's what I learned through both of those experiences. Though they were very different, there were many similarities between football practice for four years, be football players, high school, college, all right? That's what's up with the three-man role. I mean, rolling around on the ground for like four years, you'd think you'd get that after a while, you know? No, what I learned is it's a fundamental, and champions do the fundamentals, extremely well. Fundamentals never go out of style. They never get old. They never become the lagging edge. Though the leading edge will change, fundamentals remain as a foundation for championship performance in this or any marketplace. Now, I didn't get that lesson in 1975. It took me a little longer to grasp that. 1978, I got out of the Air Force, active duty, and did what many young broke guys do. I got married. <laughs> so now you can get older and broker together, right? But that was a good thing for me. We actually just celebrated 35 years, our 35th anniversary. Yeah. So, <laughs> he probably deserves that more than me. So, uh, but in 1978, you know, got out there and, and started a new life. In 1983, I made a big change professionally. When I got into the newspaper business, classified advertising, 
So that was also me going into the car business experience. One of my biggest uh, areas of clients was dealerships. You bet. That was back in the, you know, it's got AC, it's got the, you know, auto, it's got power steering, power brakes, right? All the whole list and all the initials. Wire wheel covers. Had that, yeah, wire wheel covers. They're just WWC. You got to have the code book. What does that mean? Oh, wire wheel covers, of course, right? So 1983 was in the classified advertising business. Has the classified advertising business changed any since 1980? <laughs> a little bit, a few times, okay? 1986 was a big breakthrough for me when I was introduced to a gentleman by the name of Jim Rohn. Not personally, not yet, it would be many years before I would meet Mr. Rohn in person, was I, I was introduced to his teachings. I was introduced to his philosophy, and it would change everything for a small town boy off the farm in Tennessee who'd never been anywhere. Uh, my idea of big was still pretty small, but I was challenged by someone who thought bigger and believed bigger for me than I could at the time even believe for myself. That is a rare thing to have someone in your life who stretches you without you even being aware of it, especially in the beginning. So that's what Mr. Rome did for me. He said things I'd never heard from anyone. 1978, right out of the Air Force, uh, getting married, my first job was in the cookware business. So I would go into your home and, you know, whip up a little meal and say, Miss Jones, did you like that cookware? Mr. Jones, was that a good meal? If Miss Jones had a set of that cookware, that was it. That's what I was doing in 1978. I was introduced to a guy by the name of Zig Ziglar. Zig had all the records in Salad Master, uh, the cookware company at the time right down in South Carolina. And I did everything I could in my time there to make sure that all of his records stayed intact. <laughs> I was a struggling young salesman trying to uh, sell cookware, and my mentor had a one-quart gold saucepan on the hood of his big Lincoln Continental. And we would drive around and pull up at stoplights and see the little looks we got. Uh, when people would look over and say, Gold saucepan is your hood ornament on a big continental. So that was some of the, the introduction to me into selling in the late 70s. But by the time I found Mr. Rome, I was ready for that next place. I heard him talk about things I've never heard anybody talk about. The three things that he talks about in the art of exceptional living, which will never go out of stock. Let me just say this. That is a program, audio, video, however you get it. Anybody heard that, Art of Exceptional Living? Yeah, I would highly recommend it, just for what that's worth. Uh, it never goes out of style. It will be just as powerful 50 years from now as it was when I first heard it in 1986. But Mr. Rohn said three things, Michael, that you need to do, three things you need to know about, three things you need to focus on if you are going to be a big success. And I was ready, man. I had my notebook. I had my pen. I wanted to hear what this man uh, was going to say, who cared enough just to be talking to me. And, and so I was ready. And the first thing he said was, you need to take lots of pictures. Nobody never said that. Key to success? Take lots of pictures. I'd never heard that before. I was, what, what is that all about? What does that mean? But you see... All these years later, what's going on in this room? That, that didn't happen once upon a time because we needed a what? We needed a camera. Not everybody had one, apparently. But now, different story. 96%, they're taking pictures on their phone, taking video on their phone, doing lots of other things on their phone, right? But when he said that, I didn't get it, but I get it today. Along the way, the light came on. And I'm sharing many of those pictures with you today from the uh, decades that have gone by as, as I try to give you students. The second thing he said is everybody needs to have a journal. You need to write in a bound book. Now at the time, I was using legal pads. And then I would tear those pages out, I'd put them in a file folder, and then they'd go in a desk drawer, and I'd go, what did I do with that? That's what he said. He said, Michael, you need to write in a bound book and a journal. And guys, when I started writing in journals, I got it. Everything changed for me. This is my goals journal that I've been writing in for almost two decades now. This is a journal that I took with me on a 16-day trip to Africa. It was brand new when I took it. I took that journal specifically 
for my trip to Kenya and Nakuru and Nairobi. And now, because of what I wrote in here, 50, 60 pages, didn't fill it up, only 16 days. But I can pull that book off the shelf and bang, I'm right back on the plains of Kenya with a face full of dust. How is that possible? Because your mind is so powerful when it is programmed and then challenged to recall, not by memory, right? Many of you guys are taking good notes. That's awesome. Some of you guys are trusting your memory. Good luck with that. <laughs> I'm glad that's not the program I was on when I made the trip to Africa. I don't know if I'll ever go again, but it doesn't matter. I can go every time I pull a book down. That's the power of a journal. I learned that. I passed that lesson on to my kids who've written in journals for over half their life. I wrote in journals about the life that they had with me for four years. And when they graduated high school, I gave them the journal. Not a bad gift. It's not like I just ran out and got it last week. No, I've been working on that gift for how long? Four years, even longer when you stop and think about it. Because you had to have the idea first. The third thing that Mr. Rome said is he said, Michael, you need to have a library. Because that's going to be more powerful to leave to your kids or your grandkids than your couch. Wow. Hit me pretty hard. I had a few books at the time, 1986, but you couldn't call them a library. That'd be a stretch. I actually only had two or three. One was about Roger Staubach. <laughs> Sorry, I was a Cowboys fan at that time. But the other was from another individual who impacted my life in a huge way. And the name of that book was called Secrets of the Millionaires. I didn't get it. I had the book. There's the information, Secrets of the Millionaires. You'd think a young kid struggling to make it and selling would be reading that book every day. Took me 10 years to even believe it was possible for me and another 10 years before I finally got the lesson. And I'll tell you about that in a second. So that's the three things. Number one, take and keep lots of pictures. Number two, bound books, journals, changed everything for me. Number three, have a library. And today, the evidence is too powerful to ignore. This is one wall in my office at my home. It's a working library. And I've got books with me today. Uh, in the cars, my 1937 Think and Grow Rich edition, right? From the first year, not the first printing, third printing, but from 1937. It's one of my most prized possessions. So a working library, man, that's pretty cool. People walk in, they see that, and go, oh my gosh, that's a lot of books. You read them all? I said, no, but I feel smarter just walking in here. Yeah. <laughs> right? Mr. Rome said, cultivate style. I didn't get it when he said it, but I get it today. Because over the years, I've seen that life lesson played out. Like the day I was sent home, my second day on the job at that classified newspaper. When my boss came up to me, and I thought I was looking pretty good. I had on a golf shirt, a pair of tan khaki slacks, you know. And he came up to me and kind of leaned over and he said, Michael, everybody here is expected to wear a coat and tie. I'm going to need you to go home and change. You mean like right now? Yes. Got it. Poor style. Or I wasn't paying attention. Or whatever the reason, I said that will never happen to me again. And I went to work on developing my style. Mr. Rome said, it's not about the money. It's about the style. I didn't get it. But I get it today. He said, poor people have a big TV. Rich people have a big library. What I found is rich people actually have both. <laughs> right? That was a lesson I got 20 years after I first heard Mr. Rome because the fundamentals never go out of style. In 1989, a book uh, came out called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It is perhaps, outside of Think and Grow Rich, the singular most important personal and professional development book that's ever been published, in my opinion, for what that's worth, just as a student. Every one of those seven habits is breakthrough. It was the first time I heard anybody talk about a paradigm, the way we see things, how we limit, how we can see other things because of our perception. Oh, I'd heard that before. Perception is reality. That wasn't enough. I had to understand how to push past 
perception, and that was paradigm. So Dr. Covey did that for me. It's a conditioning that all of us go through from the time we grow up to whatever our first job was, to whoever our first friends were. And I can offer you some evidence that we're all conditioned. How many of you guys right now when you go to pump gas, if you still pump your own gas, how many of you guys get it right down to zero, zero, zero? Huh? I mean, you can raise your hand if you want. I know you do. Right? I do. So, so Robert says, dude, I just stop it wherever I want. <laughs> it's like $65.27. Boom. Done. People go, $65.27? What is that? Gas. Random. And I'm telling you. Homework assignment. Next time you pull up at the gas station, quick mark, you know, whatever. Go around and check those pumps. Zero, zero. Zero, zero. So what if it rolls over to zero one? Another <laughs> <laughs> dollar? Yeah. What? Are you kidding me? That's how you sell another dollar's worth of gas? Hey! Oh, dude, I missed the oh, oh, oh. Hey! Oh, I missed it again. Right? That's conditioning, and that's how we fall into paradigms that all we need to do is just stop, and everything changes. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Got a mic? You got it? You guys can't hear me? Okay, I hear you. Okay, it's got me in. All right, cool. Yeah, I want you guys to get all I got, man. So. I'm going to be leaving it on the field right here. I'm just telling you. I'm going to get it on the field. You just want to see your jacket line. I'm sorry. Yeah, one, two. How's that? Yes. Better? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Even I'm paying attention. Okay, good deal. All right, so that's what I got from Dr. Covey. Seek first. Thank you, Will. Bring me down just a little. Seek first to understand. I didn't know what that meant at the time, but I get it now just by paying attention. Here's the thing that I found. Number one need, everybody, human nature, number one need, not to be loved, though that is great, to be understood. understood. How many times have you heard it? You just don't understand. You're right. So I make that my mission to understand first, then to be understood, because now I got tools. Now I can work, I got something to work with. Let's have equity. Sean talked about it yesterday. There's lots of ways to say it, but reciprocity. I learned it in this. Psychology, I'm an amateur in psychology, the law of psychological reciprocity. What does it mean? It means if you let somebody else talk, they are somehow within compelled to what? Let you talk and act like they're listening. And if you're really good, they will listen. If your value proposition is strong enough. In 1997, I sat in a room about 10 times this size and thought Tom Peters was going to flip every table in the room over. He stalked that room like a madman. I'd never seen anything like it. But he was passionate about his ideas. He delivered them in rapid fire succession. The one I got that day, I can't even remember what else he talked about, but I never lost this one. All work is project work. I did not understand what he meant that day, but I get it today. Multiple streams of income. A lot of balls in the air. You've got a lot of things going on. He said, Michael, you've got to be the CEO of Me Incorporated. And there's a lot of divisions in the Me Corporation. How are you doing in the family division? How are things in the recreation division? Oh, but let me tell you about sales. I don't care about that. I want to know about all the divisions of You Incorporated. I got that one too. In 2000, I jumped off the cliff, left my corporate job. After being a sales manager, director of sales for about 12 years, I left to go become a captain of enterprise, an entrepreneur, something I'd always wanted to do. I was an entrepreneur trapped in corporate America. Anybody relate? Yeah, I was pretty good at what I was doing. It was obvious I was a student. I was learning in leaps and bounds. I was producing greater value than I was two years or five years or 10 years earlier. And that created promotions and other opportunities. But what I really wanted is I wanted to be able to affect people to be able to inspire people, to encourage people the way a handful of individuals had done in my life. When I saw them, I saw how they walked, I saw how they talked, I saw how they shook hands. I'd never seen that before. 
My family growing up all worked in a factory. Nothing wrong with that. I just determined early on that's not what I wanted to spend my life doing. But when I saw individuals like this, I saw the impact they had on other people. I felt the impact they had on me. I aspired to be like them. And in the summer of 2000, my first paid speaking engagement was at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. That was my first trip to Las Vegas. So I got there late in life. But I spoke for the National Independent Automobile Dealers Association, one of about 13 speakers there that year. And that was life changing for me. <clears throat> I'll never forget the conversation that I had with the uh, executive director who I had known and had actually worked with <clears throat> in the Carolinas. And, he called me up and he said, listen, Michael, we've made a decision that we're going to bring you in. But, I, you know, I know you, I've heard you before, but I don't really know what your program is about. And I'm just going to tell you this. If you're terrible, I can't help you. <laughs> Does that mean, like, I'm fired, I'm not getting paid, you're kicking me out of the hotel? I mean, I don't know, but it's like, dude, you better be good. Right? So it's like, sorts out, challenge and issue, I got it. And I've been working with that organization now for about 13 years. So apparently it was awful, or if it was, I was able to recover. In 2001, I decided I would be a speaker. And I spoke 101 times, mostly for free. My revenues that year were just over $13,000. A pretty heavy downward spiral from my corporate uh, sales director days. So a lot of people look at that and go, we've got to let this guy go, man, revenues are way down. But my learning was through the roof. Because speaking 101 times, if you're out there not to get paid, but you're out there what? To gather up all you can gather up and, and invest that in the next talk. So if 12 guys are sitting in West Little Rock uh, Kiwanis Club and don't want to be there, man, I'm giving it to them just like I'm giving it to you. Everything I've got, I'm laying it on the floor. And about half of them are on the floor, too. Sleep. I mean, they're like, can't, they just ate a big meal. I can't wait to go back to work, right? They don't care who's talking. But I went for it anyway. Here's what I learned in the process. Number one, create value first. Breakthrough lesson for me. Do it for free first. Create value first. Give it away. We call that a writer down. Writer down. Writer down. I, well, you know, obviously, you've got some we'll good take students. Take a picture. Or take a, take a picture. Look, whatever yeah. works. Yeah, whatever works. Capture. We're capturing. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to capture. Yeah, create value first. Give it away. If it's valuable, people will be attracted to you. And last step, very important, find a way to make it pay. Now, what do most people want? Which step do most people want first? Four. They want number four to be number one. Everybody wants that. So if you want to stand out, just reverse those two, and you will be in the single digit percentile in the most sophisticated marketplace the world has ever known. Create value, give it away, people will respond and be attracted to you, and then you catch. That's a lesson that I've lived by for the last 12 years and served me pretty well. 2002, another one of my goals checked off the list. I went back into the journal and checked off. I became a professional speaker and a member of the National Speakers Association. I got to hang out with cool guys who were legends in the speaking business, but I was going broke fast. Because what I was learning is there's not a lot of money in being a speaker if that's all you do. I would go and speak at Kiwanis and, and, and you know, chamber lunches. They go, dude, you're the best speaker we've ever had. They didn't say dude because that was like 2002. Right? <laughs> but they would say, you're the best speaker we've ever had. Okay, let me just put this all together. I spoke for free. I'm the best I ever had. I'm the best free speaker in Charlotte. <laughs> it's not the value proposition that I wanted to create. So, but I never forgot that lesson. So here's what happened. When I got out there and I actually established my rate or my fee, that's what they like to call it, then I wanted to push the envelope. I didn't want to be the best $2,000 speaker, right? I wanted to be like, well, we're not going to let you go. We're paying you $10,000. Yeah. Does that make sense? So you always want to be moving. You always want to move where the marketplace will allow you to go. And sometimes you've got to test. We'll talk about that less in a minute. 
Being a professional is not enough. I was a professional speaker and I was going broke. People say, oh, be a pro, be a professional. I'm telling you, you can be in single A ball riding buses through the night and living on hot dogs. You're a professional baseball player, but it ain't the show. Is anybody with me on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah man, I want to be in the show. Right? This marketplace loves the show. But they don't really care about single A ball unless you live in run em up Wyoming somewhere. <coughs> right? Then you go see the run em up armadillos or whatever that is. I mean, I mean nothing against. You know, I'm just talking about being at a professional level is not enough. I was recognized. I could put it on my business card. Speaking professional, going broke. Uh, <laughs> no, it had to be better than that. It had to be not just behaving as I'm professional, but receiving pay. That's about performance. This marketplace loves performance, and they will pay for it. So I learned that from Disney, spending about two years at Disney while my son was goofy. <laughs> Sitting in the middle. It's me and him, and that's my whole goofy family right there. So we would go down there. One of us was in Orlando once a month for two years. And I was there not just to visit with my son and do the family thing, but I had my journal, my notes ready. I was watching how Disney does it. Watch how Disney does leadership and coaching and mentoring and performing and making people want to be in the show. Where people were driving and flying from all over the world to just hopefully get a shot at being in the show and it wasn't for the money. And I was asking, why is that? Here's what they were doing. Two things. Number one, stimulate the process. Whatever you're doing, change the process, add to the process, stir the process up, provoke the process. Stimulate the process and see what happens. Number two, stimulate the people. Man, if you stimulate the process and then you stimulate the people, stand back. I'm going to be reading about you online or in a magazine somewhere really quick. That's when amazing things begin to happen. That's when people pay for the show. And then the show sells out and then people pay more for it. And then people scalp what you have to pay to get to the show. I'm telling you, in Las Vegas, nobody's talking about how bad the economy is. It's sold out. Yeah. Yes or no? Yes. It's just what I found as a good student. In 2003, I released my first book. I had been writing it for 10 years. I worked on my first book, Becoming Uncommon, for 10 years. People go, dude, 10 years? Yeah, how's yours coming along? <laughs> it's not like you can write it last week, right? It's a process. How do you write a book? You can't. But you can write a line every day. And if you do that enough days, you've got a book. That's all I did. It was a collection of notes and me becoming disciplined as a writer and putting all this down. In 2003, about six months after I cracked open a box and there was me looking back at me. Man, that was a big day for a small boy off the farm in Tennessee who would have never believed that's possible. It's been the best business card I've ever had. People ask me for a business card today. About half the time, I don't have one. I'm not on Twitter either, but I'll give you a book. Everybody here is getting a book. If you want it, it's free. Take it with you. It might get to you. <laughs> I hope you feel the same way after you read it. <laughs> so, it's like a friend of mine says, dude, if you buy my book, it'll help me. But if you read it, it might help you. So, you know, so here's the book. It came out in January. My mom was at Disney when I showed it to her. She sat on the bed at the Caribbean Resort, and I handed it to her. I said, hey, Mom, you're in here. It says... And to my biggest fan, my mother, June Jeanette, thanks. How do you suppose that moment went down? Wow. It's a keeper. It's a ride down, as Tracy said. Yeah, it was huge. About six months later, I spoke at an auto dealer uh, event in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And the day after I had spoken, I was sitting in a little expo table there on the floor with all the vendor partners and everybody and some young car salesman came by and said, I'd like to get a book from you. Sure. Let me sign it for you. That young car salesman was Tracy Myers. He would tell me later on, he said, man, I just bought your book because I wanted to know an author. I didn't know any authors. And I just thought that'd be cool. But he ended up buying books for all of his 
team of people, and he began to sow seeds, and those lessons went on to places that I could never even imagine. I've gotten correspondence from literally around the world, from mothers and, and sisters and daughters and, and kids, and it's just amazing what can happen when you create value and give it away. What I said in that book is four things, and I've noticed that the common denominators of uncommon organizations and individuals, number one, they had vision. Walt had a vision. How is it possible that when everybody else looked out and saw orange groves, somehow, magically, one guy saw the magic kingdom? How is that possible? Would we agree he's in the single percentile of individuals when it comes to vision? Powerful communication. Not just communication, powerful communication. And that's really what Sean was talking about yesterday. Uh, how to do that on the leading edge. What I'm talking about is how to do that sort of maybe more old school. When was the last time you wrote a handwritten note? And if you've gotten one in the last year, first of all, you're in the single digit percentile, I'm guessing. And second, let me ask you this, how did it make you feel? Someone took the time. Oh, I know, text is cool, email's great, Twitter's fast. But a handwritten note hasn't changed for a hundred years. My first handwritten note from the Air Force to my grandmother. And this is how we learned how to write handwritten notes in Tennessee. Hi, blank. We are all all right. Hope you are fine. We're fine. Hope you're all all right. That's how they all went. I mean, you can read a hundred letters and they all start like that. How are you? Fine, I hope. We are all all right. We're all all right. Hope you're fine. Right? That's it. <laughs> That's right. But we were writing poorly. We were still writing. So my grandmother gets that handwritten note from her grandson away in the Air Force, and what does she do? She reads it, and then she throws it away? Does she throw it away? No. No, what does she do? She keeps it. She keeps it. Carries it around her purse. Shows it to people. My grandson. Right? It's emotional. She kept them all. Shoebox. Lined them up, one right after another. My grandmother passed away. What happened to all those notes? five minutes. Hand written note. It gets to places where technology and electronics can never go. It's old school. <coughs> not going to try. Expectations are high. In this room, I felt it when I first walked in yesterday morning. Actually, Sunday evening. Somebody talked about it. Two or three people were talking about it. You know, Matt was talking about it. He felt that. Sean and I were talking. Man, you can just feel the expectation. And the unfair advantage mastermind beginning to build. People had this anticipation of what was coming, what they were going to get from it. And I still see that on you guys today in really day three. And then lastly, celebration. And that's the part that corporate America leaves out. Guys, we can't forget the celebration. Right? <coughs> President Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon. Is that how you do it? You just decide you're going to go somewhere you've never been? We choose to go to the moon. We got there, and then we stuck flagging in. We hit a few golf balls around. We said, look at us. We're America, and we're on the moon. Right? We celebrate. And we don't go there anymore. Red Bull does. You know, they're sending these people in the space, and NASA's like, well, we're coming back. <laughs> we're going to leave it up to Red Bull, you know, send those guys up in a balloon and jump out and, you know, do the whole astronaut thing like that. Okay, it changes. But powerful communication was the one key that I was taught a valuable lesson by my daughter. That's my daughter, Lindsay. Now, dads, let me just say this. Dads in the room, daughters, dance with your daughter while you can. They don't get the whole work thing. They grow up anyway. And then they're living in New York. And there's no more dancing. So this is my daughter away at school. She comes home from high school one day. She says... This is right when the whole speaking thing is getting off the ground. She says, Dad, the principal would like you to speak at a small meeting at school. Really? <laughs> well, honey, that's pretty awesome. Uh, big time author, world traveler, flying all over the world. Principal wants me to speak at a small meeting at school. About how many people are going to be there? She said, well, right now, don't you hear me and the principal? <laughs> Ended. I stood 
up, turned around, and there is Tracy's friend, Jack Canfield. And Jack and I both wearing our tags right there. Of course, his is a different color than me, because he was a presenter, and I wasn't, right? Apparently, Jack got a little more out of the seminar that day than I did 10 years ago. But I stood up and turned around, and there was Jack Canfield. Wow, right in the middle of Chicken Soup for the Soul exploding. It had sold at the time about 80 million copies. But it's now probably about 10x of that. But Jack and I started talking. Everybody left. There's me and Jack talking. Jack Canfield. That's him right there with me. Uh, an aspiring writer who is in the process of doing his second book called The Ten Commitments. So I started talking to Jack, and he's like, oh, Michael, you're in the seminar here for writers. You're a writer. You're an author. Yes, sir. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> you, know, so you don't believe and believe you're an author, but there's a book that's got your picture on it. It's crazy. He said, well, what's the name of your book? I said, Becoming Uncommon. He said, I love that. That's awesome. I said, well, I just happened to be writing another book. He said, really? What's it called? It's called The Ten Commitments. I love that. That's awesome. He said, you don't have to have a manuscript with you. I do. <laughs> well, would you mind if I took a look? Oh, could I walk it out to the car for you? I mean, so I handed Jack the manuscript. We stood there and talked for another 10 minutes. Here's what I got. I was only with him for about 20 minutes, but it was life-changing for me. He said, Michael, I took the manuscript for the original Chicken Soup book to 26 publishers, and they all said no. He said, but I wouldn't give up. Because in my mind, I had already seen that book selling a hundred million copies. Is that crazy? He said, but when the 27th publisher said yes, I knew I was on the right track. He said, here's what I'll tell you, Michael. Sometimes you've got to believe bigger than you can prove right now. I'm telling you, when 26 people have said no, your vision could be shaken but you've got to believe deeper and wider and bigger. If you saw it, then walk it out. Then keep going. Number 27, number 29, number 31, it doesn't matter. Because one day you might be handing your manuscript to Jack Canfield. Or you might be on the red carpet at the Emmy Awards with Jack Canfield. Man, of course you've got to snap a picture. Evidence, right? Mr. Rome, did you get that? Take and keep lots of pictures. I got that. Look at Jack right there. About three months later, the only quote that appears in this book from a lot of people who said very kind things about my work. This book is a valuable primer on the power of commitment. I was inspired and motivated by every page. Jack can do. Wow. Say that quote, sometimes you gotta believe. Sometimes you gotta believe bigger than you can prove right now. We get two or three books or one. <laughs> <laughs> Humbles me. 
And I still think about Jack Canfield. I still think about Zig Ziglar. I still think about Jim Rohn. I still think about some of the first people who picked up my very first book. I still think about sitting on the side of that bed at Disney World and handing the first copy to my mother. I still think about all those things. Guys, I'm telling you an informal education will change your life. What does that mean? It means there's formal education. I get it. College. That was not me. That was never in the cards for me. For whatever reason. Money, just where I grew up, whatever. You know, college was not something that ever entered my mind. You went to college? Fantastic. But I'm telling you, that is not enough. There are kids in college right now, and you and I know why many of them are there. Informal education. 70% of the learning in the workplace today is because you and I decided to get better. That is personal development. And personal development never goes out of stock. Period. That's just been my experience as a student. Mr. Rome said it like this. Work harder on you than you do on your job. I didn't understand what he meant in 1988, but I get it today. When you work hard on you, everything changes. You work hard on your job, you could be out of work one day. I don't have the same job I had in 1988 or 1998, but I'm the same individual who invested in me. Does that make sense? That because of all the books and all the tapes and all the videos and all the CDs, and I watch people like Tracy and I, I saw that progression. I saw that happen right in front of my eyes. Here's what I learned. What's the top of our population? There's that single digit again. Reads more than one business book a year. So you want to be in the five percentile, just read? Two. two. How easy is that, Robert? Yeah, just two. Boom, you're there with the five percent. In 2007, the best book I read. By that time, I was like, what's the best book I read in 2007? Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by Harbecker. Go all the way back to 1986. Secrets of the Millionaires. I had the book, but I didn't get the lesson until Harv told me most people think they want to be rich. That's not what they want. What they really mean is they want to live richly. They want to have a rich life. Got it. Rich life. That's what we talk about. So this is me enriching my life about 1980. Sitting with my son and my banjo. About 1980. So if you guys will indulge me, about two years later, there he is on the front porch, still me and the banjo and him. About 25 years later, that's me and him on stage playing for an audience. Pretty cool for dad. Normal for him because he's an amazing musician. I am not a musician. I am just a banjo player. Big difference. Right? My wife will tell you that. But here's the greatest lesson that I got that I was able to learn through my banjo playing and I invested into my business and my personal life. Play every day. It's simply the law of inertia. Now, I heard the law of inertia since I was in high school, but I didn't get it until I started playing the banjo every day and my level of playing went up. To a degree where people would say, well, who do you play with? Me? You mean like in a band? You mean like for audiences? No, I just sit on the porch and play. It's just me. My son, you know. Today, guys, because I made a decision a few years ago to elevate my game, to get out where I could play for other people, play for audiences, I was able to play not once but twice at Caesar's Palace. On stage. Now, that'll put a little fear in you, right? No matter what you're doing, speaking, banjoing, whatever. But that was cool. That's a feeling that everybody should have about something that you love. Whatever you're passionate about, play it on the highest level. And then bring it all the way back to that rich life place where you can share those lessons with your grandson. That's Easton Michael right there. He loves the banjo. And my wife tolerates it because my grandson likes it. So, it's a win-win all the way around, right? Here's what I found. People are telling me all the time, I wish my life were working out differently. But here's what I found. While few people have any written business plan, even fewer have a life plan or a goal. So, here's what I'm going to share with you. Four things. Big lesson for me. Four words. Number one is purpose. And that's the life part. I remember uh, having someone say to me once upon a time, if you don't know what your purpose is, then your purpose is to find out your purpose. purpose. That's the life part. Why we're here? Why do we make a difference? What's the legacy? You hear that as you get older. You think about things like that. 
you know. So the purpose is the life part. And I say this in the book, The Ten Commitments, life is bigger than work. Not everybody got the memo on that. Sadly, most people, many people, only learn that lesson when something tragic happens in their life. And they realize they can lay down the work ball and pick it up later because it's all about life right now. But where the real treasure is, is learning that lesson before tragedy strikes. Is knowing that you can have a rich life because you know what your purpose is. One of my great teachers in the consulting business says, my work, I do the work to facilitate <coughs> my life and the way I want to live. He said, my goal is to work five minutes and make $10 million. His wife said, if you can work five minutes, you can work 10 minutes. <laughs> make 20 million, right? So the second part is the work part. It's performance, <laughs> right? And work's part of it, you know, how you perform every day. Number three is plan or your goal. Do you have one? Man, because when I got written plans, written goals, not just for my work, not just the number somebody gave me, but about my life, everything changed for me. And number four, you've already heard it in this room earlier, passion. The passion with which you do the other three. People notice you're known for something right now. It's your personal brain. In 2008, I checked off another goal. Went to Pebble Beach. 20 years it was on my list. Play Pebble Beach. Man, it was worth the wait. Four nights at the lodge at Pebble Beach. Playing golf there, spy lady, golfers here, anybody? See, that doesn't mean anything to the rest of you guys. But here's the thing. Even if you're not a golfer, go there and make the 17-mile drive. It's jaw-dropping. Finger of God stuff. So it's amazing. My question is, where do you want to go? Write it down. Get it in there. Roll it around. Think about it. Message to marketing professionals. If you're not getting paid what you're worth, what you're asking, or what you think you're worth, here's what I learned as a good student. Only two... Possible reasons. Number one, the marketplace doesn't know what you're worth yet. So that you can change that reason, right? Number two, number one, the marketplace doesn't know what you're worth yet. Number two, you're not worth as much as you thought. If you're not, yeah, ooh, wow, that's a little closer to home, right? So that's the only two reasons why you're not getting paid what you think you should be getting paid. And we can change either one of those reasons. What we're known for, the value proposition. It's what I call the commitment to becoming. And I put it right there on my car. So when I climb in every day, that's my challenge. Michael, what are you becoming today? The next five minutes, I'm coming up on time. Am I okay? I'm okay? So I've got a couple of videos that I want to share with you guys. Um, because I get, to the, I get to work with an amazing artist every day who does audio and video and editing and and shooting and, and directing and makes me look good in a lot of places where if it was up to me, I would be in trouble. And that's my son. So we created this concept called the next five minutes. And, and one of the things that I share with a lot of different groups is the next five minutes could change your next five years. Some of these lessons I got like that is an epiphany and it changed everything for me. Not for the next five years, for ever. So the next five minutes is so critical. I believe every day, personal development, personal growth, investing in you, and yet investing in your business, studying your profession. You guys are doing it. Hats off to you. I know it was not easy being here. I know it was not free being here, right? You made a commitment to you. Congratulations. <clears throat> working harder on you. I know you're working harder on your job, but man, I see the evidence of you working hard on you, and I know great things are coming out of this mastermind group as a result. But here's the next five minutes. It's just a, a program that we created. I'm going to show you a quick video uh, just to give you an idea of what you can do just by walking around.
in mind. I'll see you then. The seven habits of Michael York. So this is the kind of stuff that we do just to share these kind of lessons with now the whole wide world. So that's the power that you guys have. What you're creating in this room is going to go literally all over the <clears throat> world. And guys, as some of these lessons unfolded for me, I had no idea what they were going to lead to. Let's back up now to 2007. How many of you guys remember what happened in about 2007, 2008? Anything happened in the car business for you? Same thing happened in the speaking business for me, right? But I was fortunate about that time to... Uh, meet up with an individual by the name of Dan Kennedy. And if any of you guys know who Dan Kennedy is, he wrote a whole series of books called No BS. And that's pretty much his style. He's just no bull, straightforward, this is it, like it or don't. I spent two years with Dan Kennedy. It's kind of dark there, but that's me and Dan at the Opera Land Hotel. Um, getting to go behind the scenes. I was an independent business advisor for Dan for two years, which meant basically he just opened up his mastermind group and showed me all the things that had made him not just a millionaire many times over, but as he's called, a millionaire maker. And that was amazing. Here's what I learned from Dan. you got to make an offer. And I love that. Vendor partners were going around the room. What's your offer? What's your offer? The offer's still good, right? We, that's the business we're in. We make offers. That's what I learned from Dan. You've got to make an offer, and you've got to make it compelling. Because people are getting offers every day. It needs to be a compelling offer. And then I learned you've got to test, because you don't know if it's good or not. You don't know if it's a good idea yet. Let's test it and see. And you got to talk about money. you got to talk about money. That's what we're in business about, right? And I love what Jim was saying over here. You know, dude, you got to show me what the numbers look like. you got to show me the financials. you got to, you know, i got to see it. we got to talk about money. If we're talking about money, we got to talk about money. we got to talk about history and money. So the irresistible offer is made up of three elements. High return on investment. We all know that in the car business. Touchstone, that's the thing you keep coming back to. Believability, brevity, and immediacy. Touchstone has clarity and simplicity. By the way, this is all in a book called The Irresistible Offer. I believe it's by Mark Joyner. J-O-Y-N-E-R. It is amazing. I highly recommend it. Here's what we're selling. Here's how much it costs. Here's why you should buy it. And here's why you should trust and believe us. See, I've seen people make amazing offers, but they didn't tell me why. Why are you making that amazing offer? It must not be a very good deal. It must not be a very good vehicle. It's too cheap. Unless you tell me why it's such a good deal, why you're making an amazing offer, it's hard for me to trust or believe you. Prove. Again. Sorry? Again. Uh, the Irresistible Offer by Mark Joyner. J-O-Y-N-E-R. So there's proof socially, technically, and factually, an expiring offer. I heard that this morning too, right? Is it still good? Still available? An expiring offer creates urgency. So here's what I learned. Here's the lesson. Sell easy, but deliver hard. Deliver great value. Deliver great reasons. But sell easy. Nobody wants to be hard sell. Nobody wants to be hard sold. Sell easy, but deliver hard. Evidence, hard offers. I'm going to share with you guys uh, another one of my clients, and that the cigar thing up there is one of my clients. And I'll touch on them uh, hopefully real quickly before I get out of here. But I actually wanted to tell you guys, I brought, how many of you guys have had one of the drinks over here, one of the energy drinks, in the last day or so? Yeah, these are over there. Uh, I'm also told that they're, uh, you know, they're pretty good if you stayed up too late or, you know, whatever. I don't know that personally, but. Uh, but these are, it says right on the can, insanely healthy energy drinks. So, uh, you know, Red Bull is like a $5 billion industry. One of my clients now that I'm working with has these healthy energy drinks. And what they've done is one of the things that I talk about, one of the lessons that I learn, one of the things that I see in this room, people like Tracy and, and, and a lot of other individuals here, they've extended the brand. They've expanded the brand. So I want to show you just real quickly what it looks like when you go from just being a company who sells healthy and, and energy to extending or expanding the brand.
yeah, that's one of the companies I get to work with. How many of you guys think that's a pretty cool assignment? We had a little bit of fun doing that. Yeah, it's awesome. Plus, I love their products. So uh, if you want to know more, I'll tell you how to, how to find out a little bit more about that. But I want to talk just for a minute about extending the brain. How about these guys? What business are they in? Oh, well, they used to be in the pawn business. What business are they in now? A lot of other businesses. How many of you guys have been there? Been to, to, to uh, the, the pawn shop, their pawn stars in Las Vegas? They're selling everything. I mean, there's shirts and socks and cups and all that, right? They're in a lot of businesses now. How about these guys? What business are they in? Everything. Yeah, we don't even know, right? They used to be in one business, and now, bam, they're everywhere. Exactly, man. They tapped into the Walmart market. I mean, they have mobile homes, absolutely. Books, uh, you know, every kind of a clothing article imaginable. My wife has most of it. You know. <laughs> bought a pink camo uh, zipper and, and a cap. There's a Duck Dynasty edition Clayton mobile home. Seriously. Oh, that wasn't even a joke. Now, I've never even watched I'll take you one best. If you actually read the book and get to know Phil, Phil is, a, is as we say, back home in deep water. Right? And I like his philosophy. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But extending your brain. Now, what is this guy? What business is he in? The guy, the guy who yeah, lives after he left. Yeah. Right. yeah, he's in everything, right? And if he's not in it, he's looking to get in it. That's the cool thing. That's what I love about masterminds like this. Is all of a sudden, everybody extends and expands their brain. What they do, what they're known for, how they cash in. That's my question. You, what business are you in? That's what people ask me once upon a time, and I had to get a better answer. What kind of cow is this? Holstein. Holstein. Some people say Jersey. If you ask anyone under 12 years old, what will they say? Dairy. So dairy is a good answer. What? Somebody said and. It's a Chick-fil-A cap. It's a Chick-fil-A cap. Right. It's a Chick-fil-A creating a whole new breed of cat. Because they extended a brand, expanded a brand, and placed themselves right in the middle of our lives where they get identified in more ways than just with chicken. I love their philosophy. Here's Chick-fil-A's philosophy. Preserve the core, but push the edge. Push the edge. Now, you're never going to get a hamburger at Chick-fil-A. Right? I just believe that's too edgy even for them. At the center of everything is what? Chicken. Chicken, right? So that's the core. That's never going to change. But they try different stuff out there. <laughs> and part of their philosophy is you never get anything on Sunday. That's just, it's not up for debate. That's a core value. My question to you, what are your core values? What's your core business? What are your core values? Non-negotiable. We don't talk about them because everybody knows they're set in stone. Guys, be on guard for distractions. And some of the most powerful things in your business can become some of the worst distractions when we're talking about your life and your work and all of these other things that we talked about. So this is just a list. This is not my list. This is from a, a book called uh, Forward Freeway. My big old distractions list. So it's just like anything else. There's a lot of things that can be good or bad depending on how you use them. You ever turn them off. So you can be turned on in another area. Your philosophy matters. I didn't understand what Mr. Rome meant when he first said that, but I get it today. My philosophy is non-negotiable. In some areas, I am uncoachable. Just lessons that I've learned from people who caused me to respond in that manner. The commitment to winning, one of the things I talk about in the book. And I hear people say, well-meaning people, talking specifically in many cases to young people, saying it doesn't matter whether you win or lose. And I sort of understand what they're trying to say. I understand they mean well, but that does not line up with my philosophy. Nope. Here's what I would say to you. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose until you lose. lose. And suddenly, it makes all the difference. Right? That's the kind of philosophy that I want to perpetuate. Free enterprise. Congratulations to you, captains of enterprise. You're making a difference. Whether you realize it or not, someone is looking at you. You may not know right now how special you are in the eyes of a child. But I'm telling you, you're having an impact on people just walking your life 
out every day. The commitment to winning matters, and it always will. So, there's my seven breakthrough lessons. How many of you guys believe there are more than seven? <laughs> right, but if I told you there was 41, you guys would go, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm not asking you to get them all. I hope you got something from some of them. If you were looking for a to-do list or three keys or five ways, seven habits already exist, you're going to take home a copy of the Ten Commitments. Some of the stuff that I talked about is in there. If you want more of that stuff, uh, you can ask me about it. This is one of my clients. Anybody staying over today? Anybody not leaving today who might want a cigar? Uh, this is my uh, friend, client over here, downtown Charlotte, 10 minutes away. And I think next time we're going to try to plan. In January's meeting, Sunday, after the, instead of the, uh, we might go to social, but we'll plan a trip to the cigar shop. Yeah, it's and just, a, it's a private lounge. It's, oh, it's you know, just field trip. We call it our living room away from home, and whether you like cigars or you don't like cigars, there's kind of an area in there for you. But you guys have been awesome. If there's anything that you want today, anything you want to know about, uh, even the energy drink or cigars or uh, Charlotte or <coughs> some point here, you didn't quite get everything, this is it. Uncommon at michaelyork.com. That's my personal email address. Feel free to email me with any unsolicited testimony or uh, uh, any information that you guys want about what you've heard today. It has been my pleasure to be here and offer some value to you and just offer you a timeline of lessons that I've learned. Guys, a lot of things have changed since I got into the marketplace in 1978. And there's just a few of them right there. But what never goes out of stock is personal growth and personal development, fundamentals of achievement. And I've even learned a great uh, substitute or a great way to transcend that paradigm of achievement is really contribution. And I cannot wait to hear about the contributions to this marketplace that come out of this mastermind group in this room. In 1937, Think and Grow Rich was published after 20 years of research. It is still today. Every bit as powerful as it was the day it came out. The 17 principles of wealth are unchanging. In 1955, Earl Knight <coughs> recorded The Strangest Secret. If you don't have it in your library, I highly recommend that 30-minute audio tape. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe still one of the most powerful recordings ever uh, in the marketplace. 1989, The Seven Habits should be in every library. And here we are in 2013 in the unfair automotive uh, mastermind group, and guys, it's been my pleasure to be with you. I'm going to leave you with a quick story about, I told you I got to Las Vegas late in life, and somebody that I always uh, admired and kind of followed for a time, I always wanted to see him, I never got the chance, and that was Danny Keynes. Anybody ever see Danny live in Las Vegas? Um, Danny's story was he was a professional athlete, he was a professional baseball player. That's all he ever wanted to be growing up. He was an amazing athlete, an amazing talent, but an injury ended his career. And so he shifted over. Didn't know that was going to happen, but he shifted over to actually become an entertainer. He was a, a, a comic and just an amazing impressionist and a singer. He was a, a talent that went out and played all the little small dive clubs and places. So he, he sort of rewrote his goals journey. Right? Totally different path, totally different aspiration. One day he wanted to become a headliner in Las Vegas. So while he's out there, year after year, slugging it out, uh, people started finding out about him. People started talking. Unsolicited testimonials started to happen. And all of a sudden, uh, he caught the eye of someone in Las Vegas. He had a chance to open up for Bill Cosby. And Bill Cosby raved about him. He actually brought him back out at the end of his show. And, and, and Danny would get excited. And he said, man, this might, be, this might be my big deal. One day I'm going to be a headliner in Las Vegas. I can see me you know, making a million dollars a year. I'm the man in Las Vegas. He could see that vision. But there he was playing some dive club in run -em up Wyoming or wherever. But one day he got a call from Steve Wynn. Ended up in a meeting in Steve's office in Las Vegas. Now, can you imagine trying to prepare for that presentation? What would you say? I mean, how would you propose to this billionaire what you wanted, what you could bring, the value proposition that you had? It was actually a very short meeting. Because when Danny sat down, Steve had already made up his mind that Danny was the guy. And he said, Danny, I've watched you for years. I've seen your work. You're the guy that we want. I want you to be the star in our new theater, and I want to know what's it going to take. Danny's mind is spinning. Really, he can't believe it. This is it. 
What should I ask for? Man, I wonder how long it's going to be. It's got to be a million dollars a year. It's got to be a million dollars a year. Well, Steve, how long are we talking about? Ten years. And then he has blurted out. Ten million dollars. Steve had already made the decision. Done. I'll have the papers drawn up and sent to your room tonight. That night, when the papers were brought over, Danny could barely breathe as they were handed to him and he opened the envelope. There was his agreement to become a headliner in Las Vegas at the Theater of the Mirage where Steve Wynn had spent $35 million to create a theater just for Danny Gans. And he got his $10 million deal. But it wasn't $10 million. It was $10 million a year. For 10 years. True story. Here's what I want to share with you. Who believes bigger for you than you can believe even for yourself? You never know until you get around big thinkers and bigger thinkers. Congratulations to you guys. That's what you've chosen. That's where you are. People who believe bigger for you, maybe than you can even fathom, a place that you could go. It happened for Danny Gans, and for the next 10 years, Steve Wynn had already seen it. He was the entertainer of the year in Las Vegas until Celine showed up. And then until, unfortunately, Danny's untimely death. But he checked that one off the list and created value that was undeniable and one of the greatest entertainment capitals in the world. And that's my wish for you, that you do something really big because you're surrounded by people who believe that way and because big really is about. Thank you, guys. Let me do that.